All right. Hey guys, Dr. Greg here. And on today's episode of the Daily Dose of Dr. Greg, I have Dr. Michelle Jorgensen. Michelle has quite the journey. She is not only uh, a, a traditionally trained dentist that's transitioned into a biological dentist. She's also gone to the garden and to the internet to help people come along and live the life that they really are truly designed to live. So Dr. Michelle, it's an honor to chat with you today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's fun. So I, 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 did some reading up on you. And it sounds like, I, I always love to know people's journeys, right? So it sounds like you maybe were a traditionally trained dentist and kind of did the old uh, drill them, fill them, bill them world for a while. And you got a lot of exposure. And then you had the opportunity to walk through your own health journey. Tell us more about what you got to experience. Yeah, so I was raised in a dental family. My father's a dentist. I actually have three younger den three younger brothers that are dentists. So this is just something that our family has done forever. And so when I got into it, that's just what I expected would happen as well. And we had a busy practice. I was doing a lot of cosmetic dentistry. My father and I were actually practicing together at the time. Mm -hmm. And I started, you know, feeling lousy. This is kind of the story you hear from a lot of people. And I went all the traditional routes. I checked with doctors, x-rays, all kinds of things. My complaints were gut health, which, you know, I thought now oh, everybody has gut problems. This is nothing unique. So we worked on our diet and I changed a bunch of things and it helped, but not significantly. Okay. But the big ones were I had numbness in my hands, uh, particularly my right hand, which when you're a not dentist, when you're that a doesn't dentist. work. Yeah. You actually have to be able to hold an instrument. Yeah. And my memory was just shot. And I've always had a very good memory. And I could not remember a patient's name from room to room. So it was so evident that something had changed because I had, you know, it had been better before. And so I could tell something was wrong. Right. Again, I went to every doctor, every everything and had no answers. So I had my practice for sale at this point. I couldn't continue Whoa. doing what I was doing. And I was looking at all sorts of al alternates, you know, consulting what I was going to, I was in my mid thirties. My husband worked for the practice as well. So this was our entire livelihood that was going to be going down the tube. Oh and uh, finally a, a co um, a, a fellow dentist said, you know, have you looked into mercury poisoning at all? And I just said, well, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any fillings. I mean, I knew that silver fillings had mercury in them, but I don't have any myself. Right. And I said, well, I don't have any fillings. And he just laughed and he said, oh, it's not the fillings you have. It's all the fillings you've been dr drilling out for the last, you know, eight, 10 uh, years yeah. with no protection whatsoever. And I had never given it even the slightest thought because the entire mercury talk in dental school is if you tell someone that their fillings could be causing a health problem, you will lose your license. Yes. Oh my gosh. I we my That's wife. The whole talk. You just got the whole talk. My <laughs> wife and I have really good friends, and and they're sweet friends of ours, and we raised our kids together. And she's a traditionally trained dentist and does orthodontic work. And we went there once to have the mercury conversation, and then we're like, okay, this is not a friendly place for our conversation to go because she's like, you are crazy, Greg. Like you are. There's that's impossible. And I was like, okay. And, and I think it's important to have those conversations sometimes because some people are so narrow-minded and not in a bad way, but they're like, like, what if it could cause an issue? And if it could, then what could that yeah. look like? Okay. So you had this possibility put in front of you, like it could potentially be mercury. So maybe talk about, did you do like a urine provocation test? Did you do a blood test? Like, how did you walk down that journey to figure like, oh my word, I am full of this stuff. Yeah. So I knew enough to know to go to a doctor that wasn't in the traditional world, you know, so I thankfully went to a doctor. She was an MD, but she uh, has really practiced, you know, kind of broaching both both sides of the line. And she talked about how it had to be a provocation test. So for those that might not what, know what that means, basically mercury, when it's in the system, it goes and hides. It hides in organ systems. It hides particularly in the brain. Right. And when you do a blood test, a hair analysis, a urinalysis, you're only getting the mercury that's actually free. So you're right. not actually seeing the true situation in the body. So yes, I did a provocation test, came back mercury toxicity off the charts. Wow. So all of a sudden now I finally had my answer, but then yeah. that was just the start of the journey, right. you know? And so she said, well, you're not going to fix anything if you keep putting it in as fast as you try to get it out. So she said, there, there, there are ways I've heard of dentists that have figured out ways to remove these safely. 
So I had to go and find organizations that did this. I didn't know they existed. You know, this is not like widely publicized in dentistry. Big so time. I didn't even know these organizations existed. They have entire protocols. I started learning the protocols, but it was for me. It wasn't for my patients. It was right. for me so yeah. that I could continue practicing. And then all of a sudden I thought, well, gosh, maybe this is good for my patient. And Oh, maybe it's good for my dental receptionist that's sitting, you know, up there in the HVAC system circulating in it. And what about my dental assistant or the hygienist? You know, they're having infertility issues. They're having other health challenges. Maybe, maybe this could have something to do with that. And so my mind started going there and then patients started noticing. I mean, because when you're doing these protocols, they're going to notice. <laughs> this, is, right. this is significantly different than just going to have, a, you know, a filling taken out. Yeah. So they started noticing and saying, gosh, my, my doctor's been looking for somebody that does this. Can we tell them about you? And then the doctor started calling and saying, well, if you do this, we'll what about this? Do you also do this? And I, I would have no idea what they were talking about. I'd just kind of nod and smile. And then I would go and do some major research and find really? out what the heck they were even talking about so that I could call them back and say, yes, I do that now. Oh um, so often the doctors knew much more than I did as a dentist about my own, my own field, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I didn't, we aren't told or taught the dental health has much to do with overall health. Gum disease is kind of like a big thing. People talk about it, but that's as far as it goes. Right. And now I tell dentists, they say, oh yeah, I know about that dental, that gum disease thing. And I'll say, that's just like, the, that's like kindergarten. Like you have no idea where we're going to go, you know, with, with this beyond just okay. that. So I had to learn. I had so to learn. you had an opportunity to be the subject of the journey and and walk through what does it look like to, what are the symptoms I have? What is the journey to get well? And then also how can I stay doing my calling as a dentist? And I love how you said, uh, not only protect me, but the but the people that are around me and supporting me. So it just makes sense, right? Yeah. You do the right thing and you do it right. So how yeah. long, I mean, it, uh, and this is not like take two of these and in the morning you're gonna be a million bucks. So your journey took yeah. some time. So give us an idea kind of the of maybe the the timeline that it took for you to start noticing some change. I started noticing change fairly quickly mm -hmm. that there was something moving, you know, something was changing, but it was probably at least five years before I went, my brain's back. Wow. All right. I can do this. My brain is back. But again, remember I was still being exposed. Right. So, you know, even, even with all the precautions we use, there's still going to be some exposure. And so the, the ideal would have been that I'd left dentistry completely. My healing would have been faster if I'd been able to do that. Okay. I didn't do that. So it took yeah. a lot longer, sure. but um, it was, it was not an overnight process and it's not going to be anytime you're dealing with heavy metal issues like this, they take a while. I think it's important for our listeners to understand that like Western medicine kind of paints this picture of like, Hey, this is your diagnosis. This is the approach. You're going to feel better right away. And, and that's just not how most journeys happen. So we get to, we get, we get to retrain people about like, Hey, it took you a while to get here, right? You were exposed to Lord only knows how much mercury vapor as, as a dentist. And then you were still being exposed, even with all the contraptions and the dams and the negative pressures and all that stuff. But it, and it takes time. And and the thing I love about all of it, though, is that the body is truly designed to heal. So if you, I, I always say the body doesn't need help to heal. It just needs nothing in the way. So our question is, what's in the way? So I, and I love too that you're like, no, I'm going to stay in this thing called dentistry. Because if this happened to me, not only how many other dentists is this happening to, but we have to be a voice. And, and as you yeah. explained earlier, that is a voice that's not always like to be heard. And some people mm -hmm. are are definitely against that. So so now we now we do functional dentistry. So maybe maybe dive into that a little bit so that if someone's like, wait, wait, my dentist doesn't do that, or kind of give our listeners an idea of what functional dentistry looks like. Yeah, so it's interesting because in my practice now, my role is the diagnostician. So I'm the one that you see on the first visit. And I we do a we do a panel of testing along with the dentistry and they're dental specific, but we want to know how is your body performing? We ask a lot of questions. We want a lot of information on things like autoimmune disease and diabetes and um, thyroid function, hormone function in general. How are you sleeping? Um, there's a lot of things that go into what we find out. And the reason is there are so many connections with overall health and dental health. There was a book written 
I believe it was 2019, and it was written by an MD, actually, which I find fascinating, not a dentist, mm -hmm. and an MD that's also a JD, which means he's a lawyer, right. meaning he's not going to say anything that he doesn't believe is going to be able to stand up to, you know, scrutiny, yeah. which I appreciate. And in this book, he says that 60 to 80% of chronic disease is either caused by or related to dental disease and dental issues. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, there's a couple of things that really bring responsibility right back to the dentist. That first of all, 60 to 80%, I mean, that's huge. And the cool part about it is that we can clear up that 60 to 80% sometimes in a couple of months, then they get to visit you and you get to do the rest of the work for the next five years. <laughs> but, you know, so ours, ours is actually pretty quick, pretty quick to clear up. We you know we get rid of the biggies. Yeah. Um, but the other responsibility we have is how often do people see the dentist? Actually, research has shown that they see the dentist more frequently than any other healthcare practitioner. You because know, people are on that. kind no. of, in, you know, they're kind of in sync. You go every six months. This is right? just they what you it. do. I, I saw it because yep. a friend of mine's a chiropractor and he's like, I said, what percent of people have an, a standing appointment right now with their chiropractor? And the research is 5%. And then I said, mm -hmm. what percent of people have a standing appointment with their dentist? And I, what I saw was 67%. So the cool thing for you guys is there's this, there's this understood appreciation of, I have to take, I get to take care of this. Um, but mm -hmm. yet there's this miscommunication inside of the profession of what taking care of actually looks like. Yeah. yeah. Dentistry in most hands and most offices is mechanic work. It's there's a hole in the tooth and we're going to fill it up with something. Mm -hmm. And so that's just mechanic work. Unfortunately, there's never really this question of, well, what caused the hole to begin with? Right. What should it be filled with so that it doesn't harm the body f further? And mm -hmm. Are there other impacts? Are there things in the body that led to that problem? And could the thing that you do then lead to other issues? So there's so many connections that really dentistry has a responsibility, I believe, to understand. Mm -hmm. And my big focus, I mean, I do a lot of educating with, you know, I, I honestly don't like to talk to dentists much. I have a training academy and people make me do it, but <laughs> I prefer, I actually prefer just to talk to people because my feeling is, is if the people understand the implication and the, the connection here, they will then demand it of the profession. 100%. And then the profession will have to stand up and say, ah, maybe there's something we're missing here yeah. because yeah. there is so much here. And I like to take it down to very simple, understandable, research-based. You know, I changed the my title to functional dentist because I don't like the word holistic dentist, which is often used. Right. The reason I don't like it is because when you think of holistic, what do you think of? You know, you think of tie dye, you think you're going to come into my office and you're going to have beads hanging in the door, yeah, and we're going to have yeah. incense burning, and we're going to be doing some seances and some chat <laughs> chanting, you know. Right. And when you visit my office, it's the exact opposite. I mean, we, you know, there's, we, we are very in tune with those things, but it is the most scientific based, like technologically advanced place that you're going to show up to when it comes right. to the dental world. And people walk in and they go, Oh, you know what you're doing here. All right. Mm -hmm. This makes a lot of sense. And that's what I want people to see is that there's a lot of sense when you really get down to the science of how does dentistry, dentistry relate to health. It makes a lot of sense. I love Dr. Michelle that you have this heart to empower people. You know, I've, I had a patient years ago say to me, um, you know, Dr. Greg, who do you think you are knowing what you know and not sharing it with everybody? So there's our, mm -hmm. there's our, our calling, right. To, to get it out to the masses. And then the statement that I've heard professionally is like, how come I never heard about this? And I take that very personally. Like, I'm like, you know what? That's my job. That's my team's job to, to have a, to have a, a way that is presented that's authentic and real. And that someone can go, that's going to change how I do things tomorrow morning. So, so you talked about the concept of even teeth being able to heal. Right. So, I mean, this is different than I'm sorry, there's a hole in your tooth. The only thing we can do is, is drill it and fill it and you're bad. So that's a, that's a new concept. So maybe share with our listeners kind of your philosophy and what you've seen professionally proven that that's how it works. 
You know, it all goes down to what a tooth is made of. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm all about simple and I'm all about really understanding things from a base level. So a tooth, the outside of the tooth, the part you see out here is made of enamel. You've heard that word before. What you may not have heard is that that enamel is made of minerals and the main mineral is called hydroxyapatite. Right. So it's basically a calcium phosphate complex that uh, with a few other little other components. And that's what makes the outside surface of a tooth. Well, those minerals are held in a crystalline structure. So kind of a lattice like this. Right. And when we eat, acidic food or when the bacteria that are in our mouth eat acidic food or sugary food, mm -hmm. they create acid. That acid actually pulls minerals out of that lattice. So I like to think of it a little bit like a threadbare blanket, right? you know, a blanket that has all the threads, you know, in or versus a threadbare blanket. There's a lot of holes in there or a sponge. Well, when you eat acidic foods or there's a lot of bacteria that eat sugar and they create acid, it pulls the minerals out of the tooth. So what have we been told forever to do if that happens? Use fluoride, right? So we're going to get into, might as well just dive head Let's first. Let's go there, right? That is a hot <laughs> topic. And I, and I, again, that's one of those conversations I don't have with my friend who's a dentist, but that's yep. the, the thing, right? And we, and so let's dive into that because I've, I have lost friendships over this conversation. <laughs> really, it honestly just comes down to what is fluoride. Fluoride is a similar component Fluoride is similar to calcium. So what fluoride does is it will actually incorporate in that lattice of minerals, it will actually join that lattice and form a hard crystal in the tooth. It causes, it creates fluorapatite instead of hydroxyapatite. It's just a different form of a similar molecule. Okay. It is harder and more brittle than a hydroxyapatite molecule. So the harder part we like, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Harder part's great because it's going to make the tooth more resistant to that acid attack, to acid dissolving it. The problem, one of the problems is the more brittle piece right. because hydroxyapatite is also the mineral component of bones. Mm -hmm. So when you're adding fluoride to the entire system, you're actually going to change the composition of your bone structure as well as your tooth structure. Mm -hmm. And a harder, more brittle bone is more prone to fracture. So what they're finding is higher rates of hip fractures and other fractures in areas that are highly fluoridated because that fluoride has changed the crystalline structure of the bone itself. Well, I'm not okay with that. The other problem with fluoride, well, there's multiple problems with fluoride, but another biggie is if you look on the periodic table, go back to high school chemistry, right. fluoride is right next to chlorine, iodine, bromine. They're all on a classification called halides. Right. Well, iodine is actually necessary for every, it's necessary to activate every cell that secretes something. And mm -hmm. one of the primary cells that secretes something is your thyroid that right. secretes or activates thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. Fluoride is a bully. So it will push out iodine in that flora, in that thyroid hormone, and it will appear to a blood test like you have activate, activated thyroid hormone. So you'll take the blood test and they'll say, you don't have low thyroid levels. You're actually just fine. And you say, but I feel like garbage. Exactly. There has to be something going on here. Right. So the problem is, is that thyroid hormone has been activated by fluoride rather than iodine. It right. shows that you're fine, but you have no activity. So low thyroid is an is a very, very common thing that happens in high fluoridated areas. Well, how many people do you know that have low thyroid issues? <laughs> well, and even you look at these kids' toothpaste, right? And it says on there, you know, should should your child swallow this contact poison control? I'm like, hey, do, don't you watch your three-year-old brush their teeth? Like and then he's squirting the whole thing in there and sucking <laughs> on it and yeah, and I, I, it's a I just, poison. <laughs> and yet, and yet the money behind, and this is not to bash <clears throat> the big companies, but I mean, there's, there's a lot to it. And I think for, for our listeners, like if you really look into the thyroid function and you understand what a halide is and, and balance and all of those things that are worth, like it is truly, truly, it is, it is bad stuff, but yet there's this like, no, it's fine. No, it's fine. Um, that stuff's crazy. And I just, it just breaks my heart that why can't we, there just be an authentic conversation? about how the body's put together and where it's at. But yet, and that's part of our job is to be a voice. And, and, and the voice doesn't mean that everyone agrees with us. The voice says, I sleep at night because the things that I say are based in research and they're not, <clears throat> I don't get paychecks from drug companies every month to, to say things. And it's like, 
And I love that you have a substantial social media following because that means that your voice is being heard and carried. So I, I'm grateful for you, Dr. Michelle, and I'm grateful that you are the voice because that's it needs to be shouted for the mountaintops. I mean, I look at, I had a young patient years ago that um, had neurological issues. They had like early autism type things. They lived on a farm. And I was like, what changed you guys? Like what changed? And they're like, well, we went to the doctor and they said like, because we live on the farm, like kid needs a multivitamin and it should have fluoride in it because we live, we have well water. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what if we just take that out? What if we just take it out? And literally in 10 days, this kid reverted right back to where they started. And the parents were like, that's crazy. And I was like, I agree. It's crazy. And the body responds appropriately to its environment. And this stuff is not... Yes. And that's the thing. It does make the tooth hard, but brittle is a very real thing. People like they need to, we need to grasp that. So thank you for, uh, for having that conversation. Um, and and you know, right. Just to finish that, cause I didn't finish the first question you asked yeah. um, about how do you heal a tooth? Right. So I have really learned that I don't need everyone to agree with me. Like I don't need to change their mind and I don't need to even convince them that I'm right and they're wrong because that really doesn't solve anything or gets you, doesn't get me anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I am all, uh, my whole intent is to show that there's actually a better way. I don't even have to bash fluoride. I mean, I'm happy to do that if you want me to, but I don't even have to go there. I can just show you that there's actually very little fluoride naturally in a tooth structure. The mineral that's in the outside of a tooth, like we talked about, is called hydroxyapatite. So if the acid is dissolving minerals, they're dissolving hydroxyapatite. So why would we actually put something back to plug the hole to make that threadbare blanket, you know, thick again? Why would we actually put something back that was never there to begin with? Right. Why don't we just put the thing back that was lost? So mm -hmm. again, I don't even need you to believe me about fluoride, but I want you to understand that your tooth, if it has holes, if there's these microscopic holes and pores, mm -hmm. the thing it's lost is hydroxyapatite. So right. guess what's going to heal it? Putting hydroxyapatite back in the holes. Right. So that is what I recommend is let's just use the thing you lost to repair the hole that's there. And can you heal these holes? Can you fill the holes back in? Absolutely. If there's a caveat with this, yeah. Yeah. if the hole is only as deep as the enamel layer, because remember we talked about that's where the hydroxyapatite is. It's right. in the outside layer of the tooth. If the hole or the cavity, and what is a cavity? It's basically just a place where the minerals were pulled out and bacteria crawled in, mm -hmm. literally. Right. So then the bacteria crawl in deeper, they eat more sugar, they deposit more acid, they dissolve more minerals, and they crawl deeper into the hole. That's all a cavity is. So if they've only crawled through the enamel layer, then you're going to be able to put hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite is actually antibacterial as well. Right. So it will kill the bugs in those deeper holes once you've added it back in. Now, if the hole has progressed into the dentin layer, there are little microscopic tubules in that dentin that go all the way through the tooth, literally a mile's worth in every tooth. And those, once the bacteria have traversed that far, you're not gonna be able to just plug a hole and get rid of it. So if it's into the dentin layer, you're gonna need a dental restoration or you're gonna need to remove that, that decayed layer and put something back in. So that's the caveat. Yes, you can heal a tooth if, the hole is in the enamel. That's so important. So then let's go there, right? So we obviously we're not going to use a, a mercury amalgam approach and that, but that doesn't mean that everything other than a mercury amalgam is the right thing to do. So for our listeners, if they've, if they're, if they're now into that dentin layer and the doctor's like, Hey, we got to fill a cavity, um, empower our listeners a bit to say, to ask some questions or what to look for in that type of a procedure. So you're going to want to use a uh, composites called composite resin, or depending on the size of it, that's if it's a smaller area or porcelain, if it's a larger area. And porcelain, honestly, is the preferential treatment or preferential material to use, but you have to remove some tooth to make room for the porcelain if the cavity is just small. So if the cavity is small, I don't recommend porcelain because we actually have to remove good tooth structure just to make room for the porcelain to fit. And I'm not okay with that. Yeah. So we use composite resin. It actually bonds those tubules that I talked about. It actually infiltrates into those tubules and that's how it sticks to the tooth. The old amalgam and mercury fillings, they actually had no glue with the tooth. There was no integration with the tooth at all. So they leak badly. And you know, this is a thing that I talk about with people with mercury fillings all the time. They are 50% mercury. Right. They have been forever. Mm -hmm. Still are 
still today, still put in teeth today. Okay. Um, the problem dentally with them is that they leak. There's no glue. There's no bond with the tooth. So bacteria leak around the edges of these fillings and you get new decay underneath them. So I don't even need to convince you that mercury is bad for you. I just need to show you your big black ugly tooth with cracks extending out from this metal filling and all the bacteria living underneath it to go, do you want it in there anymore or do you want it out? <laughs> so I mean, is, it's up yeah. to you, you choose. I know, and I if it were my tooth, I think I'd want that stuff out of there. So again, I don't even need to convince you some of these things. Sometimes there's just some real common sense it just makes sense. I love that. So 20 years in dental practice, uh, we have listeners that are like, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming. This makes sense. What are what are just those pieces of low-hanging fruit? So obviously you talked about using a hydroxyapatate remineralizing component, but what are some of the other things that are like, this is how you optimize oral health? Like what are some of the low-hanging pieces of fruit that you could share with our listeners? So one of the things that I love for gum health, because gum health is a big issue for people. So gum health, one of the things I love to use is colloidal silver. Just you can use it as a rinse. You know, people will use it as a, a health tonic. You know, they take some of it, but uh, you can actually use it as a rinse. It's going to help manage bacterial growth in the mouth. Right. So I've actually just formulated, I just today got hopefully my last samples, just formulated a new mouth rinse that has hydroxyapatite and silver in it together. So we oh combine gosh. the components or combine those two together in one product. Um, but uh, so silver is wonderful for gums. The other is oil pulling. A lot of people ask about oil pulling. What does it even do? Right. Well, every bug in your mouth, every bug in your body is surrounded by fat. So if you put oil in your mouth, you swish it around, what you're doing is you're by that mechanical action pulling the bacteria that's surrounded by fat to attract to the fat you put in your mouth. And it literally just kind of sucks everything out from every nook and cranny and balances your mouth. So oil pulling is an old Ayurvedic technique that's yeah. been in India for thousands of years mm -hmm. that people have used for overall mouth health, which also affects your gut. Big time. The three biggies that we haven't discussed at all that people need to be aware of just to even know they need to this have this on their radar is root canals. This is a this is a long talk with root canals. Yeah, this could be a week long talk. So many issues with root canals. 100%. <clears throat> Excuse me. And how do you get those evaluated? Frequently, they've actually failed and reinfected, and you don't have any symptom. The tooth is dead, nerve is gone. Right. You don't know that it's happened. And it is affecting you. There are studies that show direct correlation between cancer, breast cancer particularly, and root canal right. teeth, heart disease, right. on and on and on and on. I can go on forever on this one. Yep. But the way to evaluate it is with something called a cone beam CT scan. Mm -hmm. If you have ever had a root canal, you need to find a dentist that can do a cone beam CT scan for you. Right. While they're looking, the other place that you need to have checked is any area where a tooth has been removed. So for most people, they'll say, oh, I've never had a tooth out. Did you have wisdom teeth? Right. Most everyone has had wisdom teeth exactly. removed. And that's the yes. most common place I find where the bone actually hasn't healed. And in that area, it harbors all sorts of microbes. So if someone has chronic, they'll say, my doctor found high, you know, blood counts. Things are not right. Where is the infection? Mm -hmm. We'll look in the mouth because often we'll find it in those wisdom mm -hmm. teeth areas hiding and it's been hiding for decades right so that's the other one is a ct scan mm -hmm. find somebody who knows what to do with reading it i just told you i'm doing virtual consults today because i read these from all over the world for right. people to say what are the root canals doing what are their wisdom teeth areas doing as their concern and yeah. then the last one that i really have people very aware of and alert of is um airway issues often fatigue and things are because you're just not sleeping and right. often that sleeping issue is related to your dental health. So the dentist is the starting place for sleeping issues. Sleeping, which will then lead to high blood pressure, which then leads to high cholesterol, all kinds of things. That all can be evaluated on that CT scan as well. I love that. I, so I, I'm a fan of the cone scan. I've had it done. We send most of our patients to get one done. Um, a couple of questions. So oil pulling, do you have a favorite oil that you would recommend to use for oil pulling? I use coconut oil. Traditionally, they use sesame oil. Mm -hmm. I just don't like how strong it tastes. Right. Honestly. It's and it's for an how oil, long? Yeah. So typically 10 to 15 minutes. It sounds like an eternity. And it feels a little like an eternity when you're swishing that around in your mouth. Yeah. Um, do it while you're doing something else. 
you know, yeah. while you're washing the dishes, while you're taking a shower, while you're doing something else, it just kind of distracts the time, but do not spit it down the sink of the shower, or, you know, the drain of the shower or the drain of the sink because you're clogging your drains. So spit it into a Kleenex <laughs> and then throw it away. <laughs> exactly. And, and volume, like a tablespoon or what type of volume do you have people use? No, not so much that you're like, you know, <laughs> you can't keep it in your mouth. So usually it's like a half a tablespoon to a tablespoon, whatever's yep. comfortable. Yeah, exactly. And then, man, we dropped a bomb on root canals and and um, wisdom teeth and cavitations and all that. So how, in your opinion, like, what are some of the terms if someone, let's say, let's say someone went and had a cone scan done and they, they feel, they feel like there's an issue there. What are some, and this again, could be a week long seminar, but what are some of the, the ways that this, a person would know that their clinician, their dentist, their oral health specialist knows what they're doing once something has been observed in a CT cone scan? Great question, because I actually do a lot of second opinions on cone beam scans where they've been taken by a dentist and the dentist isn't, isn't trained. Honestly, it's just, it's just training, isn't trained to know what to look for on the scan. And they say, oh, everything looks great. And then I get the scan and I go, oh, <laughs> everything is not so great. Let me show you what I'm seeing here. Right. Um, I think the primary thing to ask is, are you familiar with root canals that have failed? You know, is that something that you're looking for typically? Right. Are you familiar with areas where you've had teeth removed that didn't heal right? And I don't like the word cavitation. Again, I don't, I don't need to win any popularity contests. I don't need to convince anybody. The word cavitation is often very off putting to the profession in general. Correct. Everyone, I, I have a brother who's an oral surgeon. He's like, those don't exist. I'm like, all right, you're right. But I unfortunately find a lot of areas that didn't heal properly after teeth were removed. There you go. Yeah. Same thing. We're talking about the same exact thing. And right. I say, haven't you ever noticed that? Have you ever seen that on a CT scan before an area where the bone isn't as dense? It didn't heal right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've seen those. <laughs> we're talking about the same thing, but the it's word itself problem. turns the person off. So I will just say, do you look for areas where teeth have been removed that haven't healed? Okay. So you've talked multiple times and I love the fact that you talk about virtual consults and seconds op second opinions. So is that typically a dentist that is sending you these or is it the patient themselves or? Patient and practitioners. We get a lot of referrals from doctors like yourself yeah. um, who are working with patients that have chronic disease and just want to find underlying causes for, for illness. Yeah. And so we work with a lot of these practitioners and they have their mm -hmm. patients send these scans to us. You know, I've actually had this vision and I don't know if that'll ever happen, but I'm like, how fun would it be to have a functional dentist inside of our functional medicine practice? And it could be like, because we see so much of it, and even in the Twin Cities, like there's not a lot of clinicians here that I, I don't like the word trust, but like, like, do they know what they're yeah. doing or do they, are they proficient in what they're, what they're going for? I even had a patient that went to their dentist who had a CT cone machine and they're like, uh, it was like an astronomical amount of money to have the procedure even done. So like, we need to have conversations of barrier of entry and like, and respectfully, like, I don't necessarily need your expertise. I just need the, I just need the data. Uh, of the scan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, the scan. just give me the data so we can rock it out. So that is so good yeah. for you. And, and, um, and then do you find yourself, like, do you then have the clinicians being like, okay, Dr. Michelle, like, what do I do here? Then do you, in those virtual consults with, with like, even, I mean, it's more clinicians like me that are not dentists, but then do you feel that or have you got some backlash of like, someone's like, Hey, they talked to Dr. Michelle, this is what, and then they take that to their dentist. And then do you get this like call? That's like, Hey, um, I guess we have a mutual patient now. And they uh, consulted with you and you said that this, this, and this should be done. Is that, I mean, like, it could be a great conversation, right? Cause it could be like, you have my curiosity, like tell me more. Um, but do you find yourself like taking that next step sometimes and, and working with the actual dental specialist to help go in and, help them do the right work? Yeah, I do. And oftentimes they're not doing the work, but they want to know what crazy talk we're talking are over here. You know, that's what they want. To know. They're, they're more, they're more questioning us. And so actually I just had this call just last week. I had a patient who was here, a younger, he's uh, here going to college. And so he had a scan done, was referred by a chiropractor, had yeah. the scan done. We diagnosed some things. His uncle's a dentist. So I had the student, the father, and the uncle dentist all on the call at the same time. I'm really used to this. You, you can tell I'm just like super open and yeah. you know, I'm just like, great. Let me just show you what I'm seeing. You can interpret it however you'd like to interpret. Right. My job is just to show you. Right. And really what I, one of my big passions now 
like I said, these are the things that people push me into is I am creating, I have a certification course for dentists that will allow practitioners like yourself to know this is a dentist that has at least been minimally trained in the, these areas. Oh, they at least know how to read a cone beam scan. They at least okay. know how to do this. You know, they're minimally trained. And then right. I have a training academy that they want to take the training further to be able to treat it. They do. But right. I think it's going to be very helpful for you as a practitioner, but also just the, the general public to say, okay, if this is what I'm looking for, here's a directory of doctors that have at least been vetted that, yes, these are things that, that is, I see and have been trained on. I love that because as, as healers, as educators, sometimes we get so energized by working with the public because they want our work. And I've even done consulting myself. And there's times where I'm like, it's a drain. Like, <laughs> but yet there's a calling, right? Like, hey, um, you only have so much bandwidth. Your practice only has so much bandwidth. And you're amazing one to one. And what I tell my, you know, kind of my vision as we look at things is, is you've you've achieved another level of understanding when you can train someone else and they could get, you know, let's say an 85% similar reaction to if it was through your two hands and your technology. So I applaud and I and I understand the the undertaking of that. And I love the fact that, you know, I take I, I like the term that says people vote with their checkbooks, right? So if enough dentists have enough patients saying, hey. I uh, I would love to have a cone beam a cone beam CT scan done, and the doctor's like, yeah, we I really don't do that here. Oh, where can I get that done? Huh. You know, and you get enough of those questions over time. They're like, all right, how much is one of those things, and what's it going to tell us? <laughs> and what we take from that. But there, yeah. I think in every profession, there's people that just. I mean, I think like there's a hunger for wanting to serve well, and I think that's what this boils down to is like you have this gift, you have this passion, and you know. You're gonna you're gonna give it your very best, but also inside of that, you've also stepped also more into just like, hey, this is not just me doing work. Let me come to your home. So you've actually written a book called Healthy Mouth, Healthy You, and this is not just like how to brush and floss and play that game, but this is also like let me come inside the house, and you are you've you've had your fingers in dirt a few times in your life and whatnot. So tell us more about kind of that that world and what that looks like from that standpoint. You know, it was interesting because um, the Healthy Mouth, Healthy You book was my first book, and it was a painful process to get there. And it really was me saying, people need to know this information, and I can't talk <laughs> to that many people. You know, there's just, a like you said, limited bandwidth, limited everything. So write this book. I had a coach that just kept pushing me, and she said, this is going to be so good for you to be able to share what you're doing. So I finally got the book done. I thought nobody's ever even going to read this thing. Well, that was wrong. <laughs> that actually was very wrong. So thankfully, thousands of people have read this book, which is wonderful and very gratifying to know that I'm sharing that information. But along with that book, I in the book, in fact, I talk a lot about lifestyle things like um, there's problems with how we treat grains in this country. There's problems with how we treat, you know, just there's a lot of different food things. And I, I'm a huge food enthusiast, healthy living enthusiast, all those kinds of things. So as I introduced and kind of tiptoed into that world of, all right, let's get out of the, just the mouth itself and talk about, well, I believe the mouth is connected to the rest of us. So perhaps some of what we do to the rest of us will actually influence the mouth, you know, kind of went a little bit backwards. Yeah. And that's been the fun journey for me now. So I have this platform called Living Well with Dr. Michelle, and there's actually five books now underneath that uh, umbrella. And um, there's a sixth coming, actually. Hopefully this girl. one's going to be a traditionally published book. So it's one hopefully will go a little further and wider. But mm -hmm. that's my big passion now is to really bring that living well. What does living well mean? a little right. different for everybody, but there's similar concepts that everybody shares. And yes. what does that really mean in today's world? And some of it has to do with things like food insecurity in our world today. And how do we find food that actually feeds us? Because if it feeds us, we're then healthy. Well, where do we get it? Or right. how do we grow it? Or, you know, so those have been the things that are honestly my passions outside of the practice that I've now brought full circle into practice as well. And that's, that's what I love doing. And that's what I uh, continue, oh, that, continue to teach. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think I even saw some programs inside of that side of your site too, where people can like purchase like a master class yeah. and do a deep dive inside of all of that. So yesterday um, was my kickoff. Actually, I do a quarterly real food reset 
And last night was actually my kickoff for the Real Food Reset, where we walk through kitchen tips and cooking tips and menus and meal planning and all kinds of things. And yeah, I love teaching those things. We're we're yoked there. So my mom is uh, my mom was actually a home ec major in college, and she, so I'm I'm the third of four boys, and and she cooked from scratch, and she taught she taught me how to cook, and I have such an appreciation of the kitchen. Uh, when I was when I was a so my mom's German, and there's a term called Schnigelfritz. Uh, which is little you know what in German. And when I was being that little boy, um, I my penalty in the summer was to go to the garden and pick and snap five gallons of green beans. Um, that is the penalty. <laughs> so I think back and like we had a root cellar, we we would butcher our own animals. It just I, I just I love that that appreciation for the process and what that looks like. I do want to circle back to the whole dental world because I just think. I think there's a lot of toxic things on the shelves of a lot of stores. And I, and again, this is not to talk bad, but I just want to create an awareness of like, give me maybe some of this for that options. So like if someone like, instead of buying this, consider this, or instead of doing this, consider this when it comes to oral health, how could you come alongside a a mom or a dad um, looking to have a healthy family? Yep. So the big one that we've already talked extensively about is fluoride for hydroxyapatite. So we're gonna just replace hydroxyapatite in the place of any fluoride. Are there products that have this available? That's been a little bit of the challenge, honestly, up to this point has been trying to find products. And so I have formulated uh, three tooth powders, excuse me, three hydroxyapatite tooth powders. One is remineralization. So it's the getting the minerals in. The next one is a whitening. And there's actually an interesting piece because we're gonna do the next swap with that one. And then the third is a children's, a kid's version of the hydroxyapatite tooth powder. So that is the swap. The whitening is the next one. So, uh, you know, the traditional whitening materials are peroxide based, (laughs) excuse me, which are not bad, um, but they do leave porosities in the tooth. And so it's going to lead to higher levels of sensitivity. It's going to need to, it's going to lead to you needing to remineralize. Here's the cool thing about hydroxyapatite. It whitens teeth because whiter teeth are simply because the minerals are more dense. And so the yellower underlying layer in the tooth doesn't show through as much. So the whiter your teeth are, the the more dense with minerals your teeth are, the whiter they're going to be. So Uh hydroxyapatite itself is actually whitening. However, with the whitening powder, the things that I've substituted in are charcoal. There's a lot of controversy about charcoal. I just did something on this. Mm -hmm. Charcoal, they say, oh, charcoal beats up your teeth. It's too abrasive. It's actually not true. There's something called the most hardness number And as long as the thing that you're rubbing against the tooth is not harder than enamel, it will not harm the enamel. So charcoal is a Mohs hardness number of two. Enamel is a Mohs hardness number of four. That means you can rub charcoal on your teeth all day long and it's not going to harm them a bit. But what does the charcoal do? It actually oxidizes and lifts stains. So you get the oxidize, oxidization from, I don't think I said that right, but you know what I mean, um, from the charcoal plus some baking soda, which will do a similar thing, plus of some salt, which will also do some right. similar things. So these are all going to be stain lifters. You know, you use salt in the bottom of your, your tub and things to get mm-hmm. stain off and baking mm-hmm. soda the same. So we're going to use them on our teeth and then it has the hydroxyapatite with it to then plug the hole. So we're going to remove the stain, plug the hole. So that's my chemical whiteners versus what do you use instead? That's mouth sick. rinse, we already talked a little bit about it. The problem right. with mouth rinses are a lot of them are high alcohol content. Yeah. The problem, they give you that, whew, you know, that Listerine, wow, yeah. kind of feeling. Yeah. The problem with alcohol is when you put it on your skin, you know how your skin kind of dries out? That's why they use it before they do an injection. It right. dries it out. It does the same with your mouth. It dries mm-hmm. out your mouth. And a dry mouth, more bacteria will flourish. Mm-hmm. So you're actually going opposite of what you want when you're using a, bact- a high alcohol containing mouth rinse. You're going to have to continue using it for the rest of your life because your bacteria count is going to skyrocket and your gut bacteria are going to change exactly. because you are swallowing that. And alcohol is a disinfectant. So yes. it's going to disinfect and change the gut biome when you're using that high alcohol content. Mm-hmm. So I, again, use silver which is interesting. It really only affects the pathogenic bugs, not the good ones. Love it. And I like to add the other thing with hydroxyapatite in there so that we're getting the remineralization plus the gum health benefits as well. So that's my swap for mouth rinse. I love it. Um, a lot of people ask about floss. Yeah. Uh, I actually 
tell you you don't have to floss if you don't want. I don't care if you floss, but you need to clean in between there somehow. Okay. So a lot of people, their favorite way to do it is with some sort of a water flosser, but like they're really messy and try to get your teenager, or your kid to use like they're squirting the, the, the mirror there, you know, I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, we're going to put this away. We're not going to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So my favorite version is a shower flosser. It's connected between the head, the shower head and the wall. You, you disconnect the shower head, then you screw this on and put your shower head back. Mm-hmm. So you divert just a little water from the shower into this water flosser. You're already in the shower. It's right. already a mess. A mess. You kind of want to stay there a little longer. It's great. <laughs> so we use that instead. You use it. It's really good for like cleaning the mold and the grout in your shower too, just in case you wondered. So uh, you <laughs> it's high pressure. It's like a, it's like a high pressure wash for your shower, yeah. but it's wonderful to clean in between the teeth. You don't have the mess of the water flosser. And some people just say, you know what? I'm never going to floss. So uh, good luck getting me to do it. So don't, they don't floss. Yeah. yeah don't have any, there somehow, though. right. Well, that is yep. awesome. My goodness. This is, this has been a great conversation. I love, I love your energy. I love your, I love your, you know, your zest for what you're doing. And, and that obviously means that you need to take care of yourself. Right. So that's a big part of, of your journey. And, and um, so that's, gosh, this is just so fun. So, You've been in this for 20 years. Where Where is Dr. Michelle five years down the road? So I'm going to be doing living well full-time, most likely five years down the road. Yeah. We actually have a succession plan. I have a partner in my practice. And actually, my practice is a little different. So I, like I said, I do all the new patient intake, but I have six specialists that I work with and that are work within my practice. So I don't do the dentistry anymore. Uh, and what I do is I have hired specialists, not just one guy who does everything. A lot of dental offices that are special, that are kind of specialty practices will do that. I used to be that guy, you know, I was the guy, I did everything, but mm-hmm. I thought, you know, I, I just can't be the best at everything. So right. I've hired the best. So mm-hmm. I have the best of the best in the practice. And now what I do is I just say, okay, you're going to go see this doctor for this. And then you're going to see this doctor for this. And then we right. integrate with chiropractors. We integrate with myofunctional therapists, right. with MDs, with functional medicine doctors, whomever also needs to be on that team. And so, so that's really what I see myself doing in the next five years or in five years from now is helping to create those interdisciplinary teams in other places, like you just said. So I will bring a dentist to you. We will get them mm-hmm. trained and we will bring them right into your practice or yes. at least affiliated with your practice. Yeah, and it's... that's really what I hope to do. I am grateful for that. And that's an undertaking. So for our listeners, like that is a big deal to get that taken care of. So, so good. All right. Hey, where do people find you? I know you're all over social media. Give us, give us some, and we'll, we'll link this in our show notes. Uh, where can people find Dr. Michelle? So it's living well with Dr. Michelle. I had to do it because it rhymed. So hopefully you can, you can remember it that way. So you're going to find me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. If you go on YouTube, I do a ton of video. Just before this, I was doing a whole bunch of video. I do a ton of video. It's all free. Go on there. Learn what you want to learn. I'm super open with anything. So it's easy to learn from. Um, that's the that's the living well site. And there's all sorts of things if you're interested in the products I've spoken about. That's all on there. The courses, everything's on there. The dental practice is actually called Total Care Dental. And the Instagram for it is Total Care Dental Utah. I am located in Utah. And uh, I believe it's the Total Care Dental on Facebook and YouTube and everywhere as as well. So lots of information. I'm all just about sharing and helping Mm -hmm. you to know a better way. And so there's lots of information out there free for the taking. Just, uh, Just come and learn. You know, Michelle, I, I love your heart and I'm grateful that you are one that just says, I have info and here it is and, and take it and and run with it. And if you need, you know, more, I'm, I'm here. So thank you for doing what you do. And thank you for spending some time with me today. I know you're just in your video studio. You probably got a packed afternoon. So grateful for you. And thank you so much. Thank you.